Well, good morning. morning. And welcome to New Hope Community Church. We are very happy that you chose to worship with us this morning. I'm very excited. These guys are are playing worship this morning. They are awesome. And uh, they just went on a retreat not long ago to Hume. It was a worship retreat specifically for everybody in worship bands. So uh, it seems like they've learned an awful lot. So this is, <laughs> this is good stuff. I love it. I'm excited. Um, Tim and Shelley, Pastor Tim and Shelley are in Mexico on a well-deserved vacation. So this morning you have me. So you have time to leave during worship if you want. <laughs> so, okay. So anyway, we have an announcement video, so if you watch the screen, uh, we'll watch the announcement video. (laughs) Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. If you are visiting with us today, please take one of our connection cards in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and let us know about yourself. We won't knock on your door, but we will send you more information about the opportunities here at New Hope. If you worship here with us regularly, please let us know your prayer concerns and we will consider those on Tuesday mornings when we meet as a staff. Thank you for being here and we hope that you experience God in a special way this morning. Ladies, our walking club is in full swing. Our next walking club will be on Saturday, April 6th at 8 a.m. We'll meet at the Dry Creek Trailhead at the corner of Shepherd and Sunnyside. We're going to meet on the first Saturday of every month. So come join us. We had a great time. Hope to see you there. It's hard for me to believe, but Easter is just around the corner. It's coming up April the 21st. We have special service times for Easter Sunday. 7.45 is the early service. 9.15 and 11 are our other two services that day. I hope you'll come and that you'll bring some family and friends with you for the most special day of the year, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our choir is preparing a special music selection for that day, and we certainly hope the message is one that lifts you up as God the Father raised God the Son up from the dead. The next men's breakfast is on April 13th. Coffee's on at 7.30, and we eat at 8. Our guest speaker for this coming month is Kevin Cookingham. He's on the board of directors for Hume Christian Camp. Our kids have been going to Hume for many years and have benefited in so many different ways. So come and hear about what Hume is doing and meet Kevin Cookingham and have a good breakfast. See you there. Hang on, I gotta stop. Hold fine. Hold back. Okay. Uh, so other announcements. Uh, I just want to uh, talk about the parent camp meeting. There's a parent camp meeting uh, after the third service today in the kids' building. Uh, that's for kids, the parents of kids that are going into fourth or fifth or sixth grade or into seventh or eighth grade. So it's, it's junior high and Heartland uh, sort of surf camp combined. Normally we do separate meetings, but this year we decided to do them together so that kids that are going into seventh grade, they have an opportunity to go to the camp that they've been going to at Heartland or they can go to Hume uh, to the junior high camp. So Jen and Brittany are going to talk about those two camps and uh, so that you can decide what to do. Also, they'll give opportunity for fundraising. So we're going to have events over the next couple of months that will allow kids to work at them to get funds to help them go to camp because camp's very expensive. So this is an opportunity to bring the cost way down for camp uh, so that more and more people get an opportunity to go. Uh, I think last year at Heartland, we had 24 kids going to camp. Uh, so we hope this year we'll have even more. Uh, so that meeting is after... Um, third service today. Uh, There is a deacon informational meeting. We have a sign up for this. If you are interested in becoming a deacon of the church, uh, then you can sign up on the front page of the sign up sheets here. Uh, That meeting will be uh, on April 7th, so next Sunday at 11 a.m. in the bridal room, which is just straight across here where the restrooms are. Um, If you want to Participate in that, sign up here, and go to the meeting next week. There is also a sign-up sheet for Senior Luncheon. That is coming up a week on Tuesday. Senior Luncheon this, year, this month will be um, an Easter egg hunt. So you can re-channel your inner child and go hunting for Easter eggs. Don't push too many other people out of the way, because they may not get back up. So, <laughs> so Sorry, I didn't... <laughs> There is the golden egg that has special prize in it, so you know it'll all be fighting for that. So uh, anyway, that's senior lunch. That is a potluck, so if you can sign up on here if you're coming, if you're planning to come to the senior lunch, uh, there will also be communion at the senior lunch. 
then there's a motorcycle ride, April 14th. That will be um, two weeks from today. And that'll be to the Runway Cafe in Woodlake. From here, I think, after the 8 o'clock service. Is that right, Richard? Yeah, okay. So that'll be right after the 8 o'clock service, a motorcycle ride up to the Runway Cafe. Uh, and then the last one is the Angel Tree Football Camp. Angel Tree is, they have football camps for kids of incarcerated parents, so they have an opportunity to be mentored by some professional football players and also some, some guys just around the church who are very interested in that and just want to work with kids, uh, especially in this particular area. So if you're interested in volunteering for that, there's a sign-up sheet for that. If you have questions, uh, Joe will be the guy to ask about that. So, or, or just call our office. So that's the other sign-up sheet. So um, we also have, what else? Sunday night church. So next Sunday in the evening, First Sunday of every month, we have Sunday evening church. It's kind of family-style worship. We, ha we do have um, child care for toddlers and infants, but generally speaking, we love families to be together. It's for every age group, everyone to worship together, take communion together, first Sunday of every month. Uh, so that'll be next weekend at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We also have communion uh, at that service. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to take communion over the next sort of three weeks. You know, we go for a gap here without having any communion. Now we have four. If you're a senior, you can take four, four communion over the next month. So, you know, this is what we're doing it this morning. Uh, and then next Sunday evening we have it. And then there is uh, the senior lunch has it. And then there's also um, Good Friday. We're going to have communion as well. So, uh, speaking of Good Friday. So, Pastor Tim told you the Easter service times for Easter Sunday. Well, we also have Good Friday service. We started doing this last year, uh, and that'll be at 6 o'clock in here. Uh, last year, I dressed as a Roman soldier and did something there. I will not be doing that again, but uh, <laughs> not because I didn't enjoy it. I just, I don't want to do the same thing every year. So, so Tim won't be able to stare at my legs like he did last year. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, it'll be something different, but please come on Good Friday if you feel... Move to do that. We will have communion because what better day to do communion than Good Friday, right after the Last Supper and, and during Jesus' crucifixion day. So that will be uh, on the, in a little less than three weeks. Uh, the children's Easter performance. So in two weeks' time, Palm Sunday, we have the kids performing. They will be, instead of worship, there will be a kids' choir and they will be doing the narrative of the Easter story uh, during that time. It should be great. They've been practicing for a couple of months. They sound really good. So come along and support that. Uh, if you like, that'll be at the 9.15 and 11 o'clock services only, not the 8 o'clock. Um, so that'll be called, that's called the Cross of Christ. Uh, I've talked about the motorcycle thing, men's breakfast, uh, that was on the video, but that'll be uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and that will be Kevin Cookingham from Hume. Uh, you know, we use Hume for an awful lot of things. We do a lot of work weekends up at Hume. Teddy leads a lot of stuff going up to Hume uh, for the youth, so uh, it's really interesting to hear what they're doing because they do a lot more than just youth stuff. They do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so come and listen to what they have to say uh, at the men's breakfast. So you're all dying to know what happened at the pie auction. I know that you're just sitting there going, when's he going to talk about the pie auction? Record number of people. I mean, it was outstanding. We had so many people here that you couldn't even find seats in the sanctuary. And it went on for two and a half hours, and Tim was very hoarse at the end of it. Um, and he did a great job, as always, with auctioning off stuff. We had more stuff than we've ever had, so much stuff we couldn't get to it all. Um, but it was just, and so some of it was just sold right at the end. Um, but we did raise a record amount of money. $26,620. It's amazing. So, thank you so much for coming to that. Thank you so much for bidding on stuff. Thank you so much just for the uh, donations that you provided uh, outside of the auction if you couldn't make it. So many people just gave because they couldn't make it and they wanted to give something. And we have a short video from the kids uh, in the youth department about the pie auction. Thanks for the pie. And the quilts. The getaways. And other assorted desserts. We are so grateful for each and every person who took part in this year's record-setting pie auction. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. So that was great. Thank you very much for that. The other big thank you I've got is there was a whole bunch of people here yesterday cleaning up the church. So if you don't notice the church isn't a lot cleaner, look around because it really is a lot cleaner. If you go into the bridge, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff happened in the bridge. So um, if you, when you walk in there, you'll realize that whole wall has been ripped out. So we did some demo work as well as cleanup. Um, it's going to look a little 
not so good for the next couple of weeks. So when you go to senior lunch or any other Bible studies in there, you're going to see it's not looking quite the same. But just bear with us. During the Easter week, uh, they're going to be doing some work in there, and it will look fantastic by the time Easter gets or rolls around. So, um, so just bear with us during the time that we are undergoing some uh, upgrades to the bridge. Um, but thank you very much to everybody who turned up yesterday. It was great. There was so much stuff achieved yesterday, and there's still more to do, but it'll be done over time uh, before Easter comes. But a lot was done. By 12.30, pretty much most people were gone, and everything was left spick and span ready for Easter. So we appreciate all that you do um, when it comes to cleaning up the church, when we have these church cleanups. It helps us immensely. Uh, prayer requests this morning. Uh, I just want to address... The first one, which is Ron Cross. Um, Ron Cross, Tim has be, been mentioning him for a couple of weeks. Uh, he was coming to our church uh, on and off, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can't remember, he gave his life to Christ right here in the sanctuary, which was awesome. He had a surgery the following week uh, to put a pump in where his heart is, and um, that was a week ago on Thursday. And then on Tuesday, we got news that he was not doing so well, uh, so we went to the hospital and um, had an opportunity to pray with him. Uh, he was basically being kept alive by machines. There was a heart bypass, there was a ventilator, there was a dialysis machine, everything that you can think of was attached to him. Um, and by three, three o'clock in the afternoon, he went, to, went home to be with Jesus. So we just ask you to pray for the family, Ron Cross's family, especially his wife, um, because you know a lot of these surgeries happen, you just never quite know how they're going to turn out. Uh, and in this case, it didn't turn out um, so well. So we just really ask you to keep them in prayer. Um, but you know, the, the fortunate thing is that, you know, he gave his life to Christ. And we know that he woke up in heaven with Christ right there with him. And uh, just the same way that, that uh, Lazarus woke up here on earth when he was raised from the dead, you know, he, staring in the face of Jesus when he did. And that's what we get the opportunity to do when we know Christ. We wake up after our life here is finished on earth and we get the opportunity to look Jesus in the face directly. Um, so we need to celebrate that. Uh, Ron Kellogg is, uh, and Ron Cross's funeral will be uh, on Thursday here at New Hope. And then Ron Kellogg, his funeral is on Friday, so keep uh, that family in prayer. And Linda Green had surgery this week, and that all went very well, so good news came out of that surgery, so we just praise God for that, and we're just thankful uh, that she is doing well. So uh, I'll ask our ushers to come forward for our morning tithes and offering. Um, communion, I haven't forgotten to do that. We're going to do that at the end of the service, so don't panic. Um, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful for this season. As we enter into April tomorrow, we get into this month of Easter, we're just thankful for this, this time period in the church. It is the greatest time of the year for the church. Even though there was so much pain that your son went through, the gift that you gave us is that through that pain and suffering came the forgiveness of our sins. So Lord, we just thank you for this season. And as we go through April, we pray that we will look to you for wisdom every single day to understand that Jesus is there for us and he provided for us the ability to be washed clean every day. Every day we can repent of our sins with a true heart and you will forgive us of our sins because of what Jesus did on the, on the cross. So Lord, just help us to remember this particular season and how important it is. The world has never been the same since that day of the resurrection. Lord, we lift up to you this morning, Ron Cross's family, especially his wife. We just ask for the, you to be there when, when and if, and we pray she does, that she will seek you during this time for comfort. She is surrounded by good people from the church, so we just ask that you be with them, give them the right words to provide for her in her time of, of uh, mourning and her time of suffering. So Lord, we just lift that family up to you and ask that they will seek you in this time. We also ask you to... to Bless uh, Ron Kellogg's family as, as they um, go through memorial later this week. We just ask that you be with them and that they will find comfort through you. And we just give praise to you this morning for Linda Green surgery, for the outcome of that. And we just know that there's so many good things that happen because you allow them to happen, Lord. And we just give thanks that we live in such an area where the medical abilities of, of uh, the local hospitals here are so incredible. So, Lord, you have placed us in such a beneficial place uh, in the world. So, Lord, we give thanks for that every single day. Lord, we ask you to bless the offering this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so if you haven't eaten breakfast, I'm sorry because I'm talking about food a lot. Um, so just giving you a heads up on that. 
This morning I'm going to talk about something that is generally considered to be rather boring. <clears throat> so I'll try and do my best to make it at least boring as I can. But, you know, when you think about food, what's the thing that you think about as being the most boring food that you can have? It's just bread. I know, we love bread, but... When you think about you know, basic sustenance, you say bread and water. If someone says, I don't like something, you go, well, you could be eating bread and water, so just enjoy it, because it's better than that. It's the most basic form of food that you can think of. You kind of conjures up images of old prisons, where all they got was bread and water. You can imagine Paul in the New Testament in prison. All he had was bread and water to eat and drink, what he was writing his letters to the various churches. Even John the Baptist had a less you know, boring meal. He had honey and locusts. It's good. <laughs> now, we've had the Daniel plan. We should have the John the Baptist plan. How about that? <laughs> locusts and honey and water. Honey is great. Locusts actually taste very good. I've had them in Africa. Very good. Deep fried with butter and some salt. Very <laughs> crunchy but delicious. Anyway, so maybe not. We won't. Stick with the Daniel plan. But I love bread. Bread is one of those things, I just love bread in any shape or form. It's one of those things that it's, like, it's almost like a drug sometimes, bread, because it just, you just want to eat more of it. And uh, I just love plain bread, sandwiches, toast, bagels, pizza bread, whatever. We had PDQs last night, if you know what those are. Those are kind of, are they Brazilian? Yeah, Brazilian like bread balls with cheese in, really good, very tasty. Um, I was going to list off all these different breads, but frankly, I... When you look at the list, it's, it's huge. So where do you even start with that? So I just thought I'd start with my favorite, which is, and my resident British people are not here today because I needed a reminder of what the name of this bread was. But, oh, there, there you are. Ethne's there. There you are. Okay, just plain white bread, sandwich bread, soft, you know, doughy type. What's the brand of that bread? I couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you think of it through the sermon, but um, keep listening, but think of it while you're doing it. <laughs> So but that, that was my favorite bread when I was in England. It's just a really soft, doughy bread. I think Wonder Bread is probably the equivalent here. It's the kind of bread where you take the crust off the side, you ball it up into a, this like dough ball, and then you eat it. It's really bad for you. My mother never bought it. We never had it in our house because she was very much a whole grain, granary type, non-sliced. You had to slice it yourself sort of thing, um, which was good because then you make thick slices and put them in the toaster. But anyway, so that I had to go to friends' houses or school to get that bread. It's like we're doing some kind of drug deal or something. But anyway, um, enough about my bad eating habits. But in the Western world, bread is really central to our culture, so much so that it's almost like rice is in the Asian culture. I mean, that's how much bread really factors into our, our cultural foods here. And there's a bread for every kind of occasion you can think of. And all across the world, in many cultures, they have an equivalent, all different kinds of breads and um, some of them are good, some of them leave something to be desired, but it just depends on your specific taste. But this morning we're going to look at what does the Bible say about bread? And we're going to take communion later, so this is kind of leading up to that. So the Bible is a very important part of the Bible. Very symbolic in many ways, bread is. Uh, it's mentioned, it has seven different Hebrew words in the Old Testament for bread. It has three different Greek words in the, in the New Testament for bread. That's not the total times it's mentioned. 492 times bread is mentioned in the Bible in various forms in those different languages in the original texts. So, it is very important. And it was a very important part of everyday life for the uh, Israelis. So, in Bible times, people in and around Israel, bread was very much part of an integral diet which included vegetables, it included fruit, it included olives and cheese. So bread, fruit, vegetables, olive, cheese, that was kind of the basic foods that you had. But I'm going to take a quick side note here and talk about a certain type of bread since we're on like modern day bread here. If you've gone to the supermarket, you've seen a bread called Ezekiel 4.9. Yes. Thought I'd address this bread. Because one of those things that you go in there, you see Ezekiel 4.9, and you think, as a Christian, you think, oh, I should know that. What is that, Ezekiel 4.9? No one really knows it. So you just, then you leave the supermarket, you forget the Bible verse that you've seen on the bread, so I'm going to help you with that today by telling what it is. Um, you also feel, as a Christian, that you should buy that bread, because it's bread and it has a Bible verse on it. <laughs> it's almost like a message saying, you've got to buy this bread, because if you're, you're not a very good Christian if you don't buy this bread, because it has a Bible verse on it. But that's not the case, I'm just saying it's... Anyway, so you look at it. So this is what Ezekiel 
4.9 says. And I don't know if you've read the book of Ezekiel, but it's a really cool book. It's very colorful in many different ways. It has a lot of stuff that God asks Ezekiel to do. Some of it seems a little crazy. So if you haven't read the book of Ezekiel, read it because it's really quite interesting to read. Uh, and this particular section on bread is no exception. So Ezekiel 4.9 actually says, Take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, and put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. Well, that doesn't sound too colorful or weird. That's just the, the ingredients. So the Ezekiel 4.9 people took that and they basically said, okay, we're going to do that. You put it in a jar and the idea is it sprouts. It starts to sprout or germinate and that makes it much more nutritionally valuable than if you grind it up and put it in bread as flour. So that's what they do with Ezekiel 4.9 bread. It tastes very good and it's about as, good as, or it's about as healthy as bread gets in the supermarket. Um, I guess it increases the nutritional value. I don't know how. There's this whole scientific thing behind it. I'm not going to go into it because you don't really want me to. So... But it's generally accepted to be a very high, a more nutritional way of making bread. Um, so this is, but I also want to talk about what happens next. Because I told you Ezekiel is a colourful book, and that doesn't sound very colourful. But the, the next part is really interesting. So after that, so when we go Ezekiel 4.10 through 13, then it goes on to say, God says to Ezekiel, weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. You go, well, that's okay. Eat it at set times. We do that anyway. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. And then eat, uh, also measure out a sixth of a hin of water and drink it at set times. Okay, no problem. Drink it with the meal. Not a big problem. Not, not weird in any way. Then eat the food as you would, a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of people. Okay, they want to see you bake it. Why? Because you're using human excrement for fuel. This is where Ezekiel gets a little odd. So he gives him the ingredients, then he tells him, bake this bread over human excrement. And then the Lord says, in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among nations where I will drive them. Now Ezekiel, having none of this, said, not so, Lord, not so sovereign, Lord. So it's respectful, but I'm disagreeing with you respectfully. I've never defiled myself from my youth till now. I've never eaten anything found dead or torn from wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. And God says, very well. I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. Because that's a lot better. So, and they don't literally do it right over like, the fuel like that. I mean, it's the stone. You heat the stone. The stone is what they bake the bread on, and that's how that works. But just the idea of it is not good. And just before you're worrying, the people at Ezekiel 4.9 Bread Company, or whatever, I forget what it's called, they only go by 4.9. They don't go through 10. 10. <laughs> they don't bake it. In, they bake it in ovens, no doubt. I don't so, I don't know if that was probably part of the frequently asked questions. On I did look online to see if anybody asked that question. <laughs> Do you bake it over cow dung? No, no, we just bake it in ovens. We're good. Anyway, so that's... Uh, uh, there was a reason behind it. I mean, God wanted the bread to be defiled in some way so that the Israelites would have to see this, this defiled food because they had been disobedient to God, which is not the first time. So, you know, this time God is like, now I want to, you to see... This happened over uh, a series of days, so that, that's how many days they were uh, being disrespectful to God, and so there was some symbolic meaning behind it. So the unclean food was symbolic of them defining God's nation. So it wasn't just a random thing that God wanted. It wasn't, there was some reasoning behind this potential E. coli outbreak that God was creating. <laughs> Anyway, so that was a bit of a side note on that bread, but it is biblical, and it's, you, know, you see it in the supermarkets all the time, so I just thought I'd go through that. So I said bread was part of an integral diet that consisted of those the various things, and I didn't mention meat. Why did I not mention meat? Because meat and fish was not eaten that often, because meat, herded animals, were used for work, they were used for milking, so if you killed them all off to eat for meat, you wouldn't have a lot left to do all the work, the plowing and stuff like that for fields, and you wouldn't have much left to milk. So they did not eat meat very often. Occasionally they would eat meat uh, for special occasions. Like in Genesis 18, Abraham has three visitors come to him. So they provided meat, but they wouldn't normally do that on a regular basis. Uh, in keeping with God's holy feast, they would eat meat. The Passover feast. In Exodus 12, it talks about the Passover feast instructions. The, cruc the, the crucifixion, the um, sacrificial lamb and things like that. And wealthy people. Wealthy people ate meat more often. First Kings 4 talks about Solomon's daily provisions. Lots of meat in that particular case. So Solomon was a rich man, so he had a lot of meat to eat. But bread, generally speaking, was the foundation of the food of the people of Israel. And that consisted of very basic ingredients, flour, water, and salt. 
Occasionally they would add olive oil. In some cases in Leviticus 2, for example, it says you bring a grain offering baked in an oven. It consists of the finest flour because it's an offering. The finest flour goes to God. Thick loaves made with yeast, without yeast, and with olive oil mixed in, or thin loaves made without yeast and brushed with olive oil. So olive oil was another ingredient that we talked about. Um, but it could also have yeast. Leavening was okay in some cases. Leviticus 7 said so at Thanksgiving, they're offering thick loaves of bread made with yeast, but it didn't have to. Passover festival, you definitely had unleavened bread or without yeast. So there's different types of circumstances that you have different types of bread. Um, but in ancient Israel, the staple bread was made either from wheat or barley. And when God said that you're going to go to the promised land, he, pr- he promised that there would be great abundance of these two things, barley and wheat, because bread was going to be a big part of it. Barley was very much the kind of cheaper version of wheat, so they made the, the poor people tended to make bread out of barley rather than wheat. It was cheaper, but it made heavier and thicker, and the loaves didn't taste quite as good, but certainly it was, it was food, and it was sustenance for them, uh, and it was cheaper than going with wheat. So I'm going to talk about briefly the word Lord. And I don't mean the word where it says Lord God. I'm talking about the word Lord where it says the Lord of the manor, lords and ladies, that kind of thing. Uh, the English word, the old English word that Lord came from was the word Hlafford, which basically means head of household. The other meaning for it was the keeper of the bread. Because the Lord of the manor had many people over the charge. They would have villages and towns inside their large piece piece of property, and they would be responsible for gathering the food and, and re-issuing all of it, including the bread that would be given as food. So they were the keeper of the bread. The Lord of the manor would help distribute it. So now if we go to the Lord's Prayer, think about a line in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, or give, give us today our daily bread. Matthew 6.11. So we're going, to look with, we're going to start with, why did Jesus include that in this prayer that he taught to his disciples in Matthew 6? Why did he put that line in, give us today our daily bread? Obviously it was important enough to put into this prayer, and it's specific, very specific. So we're going to go back a little bit and figure out why it was that Jesus put that in there. So we, in order to understand that, we need to go back to Exodus 16. And Exodus 16 picks up where the, the people of Israel... And anyone that's heard me preach before knows I usually go back to Exodus at some point because I love Exodus. Great stories in Exodus. So you've got the people of Israel in, in Egypt and then they go through the plagues. They get out of Egypt. They go to the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. And then they get across the other side of the Red Sea after their epic escape and then they end up in the wilderness. And at this point, that kind of slows down a bit. They're wandering around in the wilderness um, being led by God. And there comes a point, and it's about halfway through the second month that they're in the wilderness that they begin to grumble. They do this a lot. The Israelites are well known for grumbling, especially in the wilderness. So they begin to grumble. Why? Because they're getting hungry. So it's probably justified in this case. They left Egypt with certain provisions, and now they've, they've run out of these provisions. They're starting to share them amongst all the people that are there. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people, but there were 600,000 men plus families. So there was a lot of people that were being fed out of the provisions they brought out of Egypt. So at some point, they're going to run out. There's no line of supply coming behind them and giving them food. So they're saying things like, we wish we'd died in Egypt. At least in Egypt, as slaves, we had all the food that we could eat. We, now we have nothing. What have you done, Moses? You brought us out here, and now you're going to starve us to death? So you could say the Israelites were hangry, which if you, if you don't know is angry when you're hungry. If you have teenagers, you understand this concept. Or if you've ever had teenagers... Hangry. So next time, you know, they're really angry. Say, you're as hangry as an Israelite in the wilderness. So, verse 4, God hears their grumbling. So in verse 4, the Lord says to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven on you, and people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they follow my instructions. And God does this because he knows what's going to happen. So he thought, okay, I'm going to give them bread daily and there's to gather just enough for that day and I'm going to test them in this and see if they follow the instructions. And the instructions get really specific. So it's, very, it's not like there could be any misunderstanding here. And what's the bread called? Manna. manna. Right. So they call the bread manna, which sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for what is it. They didn't really know what to call it. It's just called it manna. In England we have chips that are called what's it. Because I don't think they knew what to call them. So they just, we'll just call it a what's it. 
I don't know. <laughs> Nothing like that, but it's, you know, just reminded me of it in, my last, in the last service. And so then, okay, these are the instructions that the Lord gives to Moses, starting in Exodus 16, verse 11. And it says, The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel, because God hears our grumbling whether we want him to or not, just as a side note. You can grumble under your breath, you can think it in your mind, you can tell someone that you, something that you disagree with, but God hears it, because he hears everything. So he hears their grumbling, uh, and he says to, to Moses, um, tell them at twilight I will, that the, you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Like he has to say this again, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. We've been through this a couple of times already. In Egypt, there were the plagues. I mean, this was stuff that could only have come from God. There was no other explanation. And all the Israelites got freed from Egypt because of these amazing things that were happening through the power of God. And then they get to the Red Sea, and there was only one option they could do, and that was to go through the Red Sea. And that could only have come from God because the power of God parted the Red Sea through Moses and then swallowed up their enemy behind them, leaving them with no one pursuing them anymore. And now he's saying, and then you will know I'm the Lord your God. Again, I keep telling you, I keep trying to persuade you that I'm the Lord your God, and you've seen it so many times. So that evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp, and the dew was gone, the flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? Manna. They did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. So then he says to gather as much as you need. Take an omer for each person that you have in a tent. The Israelites did as they were told. They gathered as, some gathered much, some gathered little. But those that it all basically ended up the same when they went to have it measured. And Moses said to them, no one is to keep it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses and they kept part of it until the morning and it was full of maggots and began to smell. Why would they do that? Why would they keep it till the next morning? He told them, don't keep it till the next morning. Because they had no faith. They had no faith that they were going to have food left in the morning. They had no faith that God was going to again provide it the next day. So they gathered as much as they could, squirreled it away in their tent and thought, I'll just eat it tomorrow if there's no more. No faith. God had told them not to do that. God said he'd provide for them, and yet they did it anyway, and that's what happens. So each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses, and Moses said, that's okay, that's what they need to be doing, because on the sixth day, you gather twice as much as you need. Why? Because the seventh day is Sabbath. You didn't need to go and do that. You should be resting on the day of Sabbath. You shouldn't be out gathering uh, bread from the ground. So you gather twice as much. And here's the amazing thing. You talk about the power of God. One day they gather too much and keep it in their tent and then it goes bad. On the sixth day they gather twice as much. It doesn't go bad the next day. It's the same bread. To me that's just astounding. It's the power of God. And then the people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Sounds very good, actually. Better than Ezekiel 4-9 bread. (laughs) Um, So we literally see here the daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And the Israelites received daily bread every single day in the wilderness for 40 years. And it was supplied by the Lord himself. This is bread supplied by the Lord himself. One day there was nothing there. All they had was their provisions that they brought with them. The next day there was bread on the ground. And then every day after that for 40 years. One day nothing, the next day next. From the Lord himself. But why? Because the Lord provides. The Lord provides what we need when we need it. And he knows exactly what we need. He provides when there's a need. He provides, in this case, a physical food. And he provides in so many different ways. Sometimes we just don't know what it is we need, and it gets supplied anyway. And it's on us to try and figure out that it's the right thing that we need. But along with it, he gave very specific instructions. We get this stuff every day. We get stuff from God every single day. And along with it come instructions. The instructions are all written in here. And yet so many times we just ignore the instructions. And then we wonder why it goes bad. 
So they ignored the instructions at first, but soon they kind of figured this out. They realized that after a period of time that there is manna on the ground every single day and that there's no exception except for the seventh day. So they get into a routine of doing this thing. Manna every single day for 40 years. So imagine if you can that you're part of a family that got out of Egypt, escaped, went through the Red Sea, into the wilderness, and then you are born into this family. Two years, three years, ten years, twenty years, whatever it is. And then you spend all this time in the wilderness with your family and you are eating manna. That's all you're eating. Manna for breakfast, manna for dinner, manna for lunch, manna for dessert. That's all you know. Manna, 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 and then some more manna. (laughs) Nothing else that you're going to eat. Well, there comes a point where there's no more manna. And we find out in Joshua 5 that on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. And the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain, and then manna stopped the day after. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan, the produce of the promised land. Can you imagine if you've been eating manna for 30 years, and suddenly you eat produce and all this other food? Can you imagine that would blow your mind? It would be like, I didn't realize there was all this other stuff to eat. This is so good. I mean, it would be a whole new world for you. It sounds very trivial to us, but imagine if you're eating the same thing every single day for years, all your whole life, and then suddenly someone hands you a basket of produce and some unleavened bread and some olive oil, all this kind of stuff. It would be amazing. Talk about the land of milk and honey. It would open your eyes to a whole new world of food. But I also want to go back to Exodus 16 and look at the verses after that, because what happens after that is that Moses said, and this is verse 32 onwards, said, Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come. And they will see what bread I have given you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Take it and place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. And the Lord commanded Moses... Uh, As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. Where are the tablets of the covenant law? In the Ark of the Covenant. So there's the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the tablets that have the Ten Commandments, the covenant law in them, and they're in the Ark of the Covenant. And now he's saying, put an omer of manna in a jar and put it in the Ark of the Covenant. That is how important it was to God that this be preserved and that this information be there for the generations to come. So bread was such an important part of the, Israeli, the Israelite sort of uh, survival in the wilderness. Uh, and so God asked it to be put in there. And just think about that for a second. It's going to be put in the Ark of the Covenant. Is it going to get rot? Is it going to get full of maggots when it's in the Ark of the Covenant? No, because God has set this piece of, this omer of bread aside, because this is going to be for the future generations to see what was important. Again, you know, it's the same bread just seems to have different expiration dates on it. So, really important. So, they put it in the Ark of the Covenant. So, Aaron did that. He put it in the Ark of the Covenant and then it, for the future generations. But we don't know how many generations went by. We don't know what generation it was that discovered this manna because at some point it got removed from the Ark of the Covenant. The future generations found out. I don't know when it was. But then in 1 Kings 8, we find out that when they were taking the Ark of the Covenant and they were putting it in the new temple that Solomon had built in Jerusalem... They took the Ark of the Covenant and it said in in 1 Kings 8, the only thing, or it says there was nothing in the Ark except for the two tablets. So at some point it got removed in between that point and the point when Solomon put it in the temple. Um, Anyway, so that's kind of the, the wilderness story. This is why Jesus used that expression, give us today our daily bread, because the Israelites had their daily bread every single day except for the day of, uh, the rest day of Sabbath, um, so that was the, the kind of symbolism, the symbolism behind, behind that. But before we leave the Old Testament and we get into the New Testament, there's lots of other areas in the Old Testament which the symbolism is particularly important. Bread was referred to as the staff of life very often. And it was used in the worship of God primarily through the tabernacle, which later on became the temple. And it was to symbolize God's presence. Exodus 25, we see that. The God's presence was symbolized through the presence of bread. Bread was used in the Bible to symbolize hospitality. I've talked about meat being served when the three guests came to Abraham. Well, bread was also served at that time. It was a very important part of the meal. And we see that um, the enemy being completely conquered was another time. 
So that was represented conquering and hospitality and also the acceptance of wisdom in Proverbs 9. So bread had a lot of different meanings through the Old Testament as well as what we see in Ezekiel. That was very symbolic also. So the children of Israel were miraculously given daily bread as they wandered around for 40 years before they get to the promised land. Why? Because God gave them food to represent his love and his caring for them despite their sin. God still took care of them. They grumbled, they sinned, and they did all kinds of things. The whole time they're in the wilderness, and God still provided for them every single day. He didn't withhold it. Why? Because it's a symbol of God's love and God's caring for people, even in their sin. Sometimes it seems that there's no way to get through our days. There's no way to get through our week. There's no way to get through a year. If we're going through one of those times in our lives where things are tough, things are hard, and it doesn't seem like we have what we need to get through these time periods, but we do because we get through them. How? Because God does provide for us on a daily basis. We might not even see it. We might not be aware of it, but we do get through these time periods generally because God does provide for us on a daily basis exactly what we need, just as he provides manna for the Israelites in the wilderness. Sometimes it's so subtle that we don't even notice it. Other times it's a big slap in the face and we realize it pretty quickly. I don't know how many of you have had these times, I've had plenty of them, where something happens right in front of you and it could only be from God because it's so random that you just instantly look up and go, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Because it could only have been from God at that time. I'm going to tell you a story of one of those times where it was really very obvious and very quick. And I'm going to tell you the story about Guy and Margaret Laird. Guy and Margaret Laird were Baptist missionaries in Central Africa. They went as missionaries to the Central African Republic, the CAR, uh, which still exists as a country. It's, um, it's a really bad shape. I mean, it was bad enough then. They needed Jesus definitely at that part of the world uh, back in the 20s and 30s when they were there. But now it's just as bad. It's on the CIA list of do not travel there unless you really have to. So things have not got any better. In fact, they've got worse. But anyway, they were missionaries there in the 1920s and 30s. And their first missionary journey came to an abrupt end and a tragic end when their infant daughter got sick and died. So they uprooted themselves and went back to the U.S. to try to kind of regroup and figure out what they wanted to do next and meet with the church, the Baptist church, uh, just to see what their options were. And while they were back in the U.S., they described the symptoms that their daughter had before, they, before she died. And the doctors there decided that it was some kind of digestive problem that they had. It's very common uh, in the African continent. And they said, if you're going to go back to the African continent, take with you prunes and oatmeal. This will help to cure children that have this particular ailment. So it wasn't long after that that they decided that they were called back to Africa, Central Africa. And Margaret just happened to be pregnant when she felt she was called back. So against all of the family and friends' advice, they decided to leave. They went back to the Central African Republic. She was pregnant. And when they got there, of course, they'd taken with them lots of supplies of oatmeal and lots of supplies of prunes. And when they got there, they realized that there was another family that there would be missionaries there also whose child was showing the same symptoms as, a, as their child had before she died. So she gave the prunes and oatmeal to this family so that they could give it to their child. And after a few months, the child showed great improvement and eventually broke out of this particular illness. That was the manner that was provided for that family. It came from Guy and Margaret from the US. They brought it at just the right time so that their child didn't die. But that's not the story. That just happens to be one of those times when it was manner that fell into their lap at just the right time. Well, Margaret had a baby, and then eventually the baby started to show the same signs, the same symptoms that had killed their infant daughter before. The problem is they didn't have any prunes. They didn't have any oatmeal left because they'd given it to this other family. This was 1931, and it was in the middle of Central Africa. This was not the sort of thing that you could just pick up at any town, any city around Central Africa. It needed to be shipped from overseas, and it was very expensive, and it would take a very long time to get there. So when she asked people if they had any provisions like that, they would laugh at her and say, I'm sorry, we just, you cannot get that here in the 30s in Africa. So what does she do? What do you do when you're in desperate times? Pray. You pray. So she got down on her knees. And this is kind of a paraphrased version of her prayer. She said, Lord God, you know what it's about. Because he always does. He said, if I'm being, she said, if I'm being presumptuous, 
that I'm sorry, please show me I am and forgive me for that. But I know you are able to provide for my children in the heart of Africa. You know that I have no money to order anything from overseas. We have no time to do it. And you know I've never asked anybody to send anything to me before. But I know you are able to provide, so please provide the things that my children need. And as she was praying, her husband called her. She didn't hear him at first. He was in the other room and he called her and then and she didn't snap out. And then the second time he called her, she kind of snapped out of it and said, okay. So she got up and she went into the other room. And in the other room, there was two men that were with her husband and they were from a Portuguese mining camp uh, that was way up north. So they they traveled quite a long way to come uh, to their house. And the reason they got there is because one of their co-workers had died and he'd become a Christian through Guy and Margaret. And he wanted to be buried, his last request, he wanted to be buried in the area where they were and he wanted them to perform the services uh, for this funeral. So they turned up at the doorstep of Guy and Margaret, so they chatted for a while and they agreed that they would do the service and they were delighted to be able to help in that way because they were happy that he felt so strongly in his new Christian walk that they, he wanted to be buried uh, alongside other missionaries that were in the field. They were so grateful for the Laird's help that one of the men said that they got provisions sent by the corporate company every single month and that they were very helpful provisions, loved most of them. Except there was three things he didn't really care for and they were sitting in his car and he said, I want to give them to you because I think your children would like them. And the first one was cocoa because, you know, everybody, every kid loves cocoa. So, um, so he gave them cocoa. The other two were oatmeal and prunes. Oatmeal and prunes. This is a true story. Margaret was shocked. She knew that God had sent these provisions, the manna from heaven, even before she got down on her knees to pray. God knew what she needed. It was already in the vehicle. It was already on its way there. So every single month for the rest of their time in the CAR, they got 10 to 12 tins of oatmeal and prunes every single month from this company. The child got better. All the children in the area uh, could, did not contract this disease anymore because of the help from oatmeal and, and um, prunes from this particular Portuguese mining company. So God sent manna this time in a very obvious way. It was immediate. She just got up off her knees. So when we embrace our mission in God's kingdom, we find ourselves in situations that are hopeless. We find ourselves in situations that we're not equipped for, but God provides us, and we need to look for the manner that God provides us because it is lo God's loving provision for us. Every single day, and everything that we possibly could need, we just might not, it might not look like the perfect thing that we think we need at the time. Sometimes it's harder to see than other times. I'm going to ask our ushers to come and um, hand out the elements, those that are doing that today, for communion this morning. Uh, and while, I do that, while they do that, I will keep talking. Hopefully I have enough material to fill the time it takes to get this out. <laughs> Otherwise I'll start waffling. Anyway. So, lastly in the Bible, the last point that we're going to get to is that by the, in the Bible, the bread is a symbol of Jesus Christ himself, our Messiah. And it's a symbol of the eternal life that he offers to those that are willing to follow him. And when you follow him, you follow him with your whole heart. And that's how it works. John 6, 31, or John 6, 32 through 35 says, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives, and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, that's the disciples, he was talking to the disciples. Sir, they said, always give us that bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. And if you skip to verse 41, it says, And the Jews then began to grumble. <laughs> Again, this is the New Testament now, they haven't learnt much over the years, but the, group, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And these are the Jewish leaders, they, they're complaining. Why? Because they've been told, they've learnt in, the, in all the studies that they do as Jewish leaders that manna comes from heaven, this is the bread from the Lord that came down from heaven. And now Jesus is saying, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. It throws all of their belief system away. In verse 48, Jesus then says, I am the bread of life. 
Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the, uh, for the life of the world. So he references here the manna that came in the wilderness. He says, my father provided manna in the wilderness, but the, the people ate it and they died. They didn't die because they were eating the manna. They just died because it was the end of their lives. It was the end of their lifespan. It was the end of time here on earth, and they died. But he's saying, yes, you may die here on earth, this, but you will have eternal life. If you eat the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ himself, if you embrace that in your life, then you will have eternal life. You may die here on earth. Your time here on earth may come to an end, but you will continue to live because you eat of the bread of life. I just want to tell a story about a baker and a homeless man. So there's a homeless man who walked into a bakery and he sat in front of the baker and he said, I want some bread. And the baker said, how wise you are. Bread is exactly what you need. And he got all excited. He pulled down his cookbook from the shelf and he began to tell the man all about bread. He talked about flour and wheat and grain and barley and his knowledge was so impressive that the baker even impressed himself about how much knowledge he had about bread. But when he looked up, the homeless man was not smiling. He said, I just want some bread. How wise are you, said the baker, as he applauded him and he took him by the arm and he took him down the hallowed halls of the bakery and he pointed to various rooms. He said, this is where we make our dough and over here is where we have our ovens. We bake the bread in here. Isn't that fantastic? And then as you got to the end of the corridor, he opened double doors and inside was a huge auditorium with stained glass windows and he said, here is our hall of inspiration. People come from all around to hear me speak here. So he let him down, and the homeless man was completely speechless. Well, that was the way the baker saw it. He just wasn't speaking. The baker put his arm around him and said, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? I can tell your breath is taken away. And he sits him in the front, and he says, he gets up to the podium, and he strikes a pose, and he says, would you like to hear me? No. I just want some bread. He said, but people, every week, my employees come around and I speak to them and I read from the cookbook of life and they want to hear what it is I have to say. I'm surprised you don't want to hear it. He said, I just want some bread. And he said, well, you are very wise. And he took him then to the street outside the doors of the bakery and he showed him up and down the street and he said, there are bakeries up and down this street, but none of them have bread as true as mine. Up that way, there's a baker that has his oven three degrees too hot. And down that way, there's a, a baker that puts one too many spoons of salt into his bread. It's not the true bread. You will only find true bread here. At that point, the homeless man just started to walk away. He walked down the street, and the baker called after him and said, Don't you want some bread? The homeless man turned around, shrugged, and said, I've lost my appetite. The baker shook his head, went back to his office, and said, I don't know, people just don't seem to want true, true bread anymore. But the point is that sometimes we just want bread. Sometimes that's all we need. We don't always want to hear about the bread, so excuse my sermon this morning, but you know, sometimes we just don't want to hear about it, we just want the bread because it's what we need more than anything else. The unleavened version of bread was used during Christ during the Passover and, is, and it represented his willingness to offer his body as a sacrifice so that we could begin our healing from our sins. Corinthians 10, 16 through 17 says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break in partition of the, participation of the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we share one loaf. We as Christians are unified with the body of Christ. We as churches should be unified with the body of Christ. We as children of God, whether we acknowledge it or not, should be unified with the body of Christ. So take the bread and understand that it represents unification. That we are connected to Christ just as Christ describes in, in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches, but if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. 
one loaf of bread for us to share, one vine with many branches. We must understand that through this symbol of Christ, we can bind together as one. And in this world, we have to understand we must work together. We must help each other out. We must lift each other up and we must pray together as Christians. And what we want is the bread, the bread of Christ. And while all the other things are good, whether it's Bible studies, whether it's sermons, whether it's missions, whether it's worship, Ultimately, what we really want and what we actually need is the bread, the body of Christ. So take the bread in your hand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift that was Christ. The representation of the daily supply of bread that you gave to the Israelites in the wilderness. And without fail, you supplied their needs every single day in the same way you give us the body of Christ every single day. And often we don't see it. He is available to us. In the same way the Israelites could gather the manna, we too can, can gather the wisdom that was through your son, Jesus Christ. So we give thanks for his body. We give thanks for the symbolism of this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat. Now if we take the juice, the representation of the blood of our Saviour. The blood that flowed from Jesus when he was up on the cross. At the Last Supper, the night before he was executed, Jesus told his disciples to eat bread and drink wine in remembrance of him. And what better time to be doing that than this season? The season when he was crucified and when he resurrected, when he was resurrected again. Jesus wanted more than anything else. He knew what was coming. He knew his death was coming, but he wanted to gather together. It was important to him to get his disciples together in a room where they could eat bread and drink the wine so that it could be remembered. In the same way that the manna was put in a jar and put into the (coughs) Ark of the Covenant so that future generations could understand the importance of this daily provision in the same way Jesus wanted us to understand the importance of the sacrifice of his body and the spilling of his blood so every day we can we can remember what he did for us as a daily provision. So let's take the juice and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the blood that was spilled on the cross for Jesus Christ. It washes our sins clean despite the color red. It brings us out white. We thank you for the opportunity every single day to turn around and ask for, ask for forgiveness for our sins because of the blood of Christ. Amen. Let's drink. So in closing, manna was God's provision, daily and without fail. God provided for his people in a very physical way. Christ in the same way as God's provision for us every single day, and sometimes in a very physical way. So we can't forget this, especially during this period of time during Easter. So we need to understand that God provides. Why? Because it's a representation of his love and his caring despite our sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we go out today, we just ask that you help us to remember that you are there for us every, every day that we need, or you provide for us every day. So open our eyes and give us wisdom to see what it is that you want us to have, the provisions that you provide for us, because sometimes it's so subtle. There are many times I say to you, Lord, just please make it obvious for me, because I'm not as smart as everybody, so just make it obvious for me and so I can see what it is you're trying to tell me, what it is you're trying to give me. And I know it doesn't always look perfect, Lord. Perfect to me, but it's perfect to you. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, the spilling of blood, and the opportunity for us every day to repent and make a 180-degree turn on what it is we've been doing, and then with a grateful heart, approach the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.